thank you for coming today. Um, I, uh, my parents have a uh, farm south of Bunker Hill, and so I stayed there last night, and my dad gave me directions, because as many times as I've been to Hayes, Kansas, I wasn't sure where the high school was. I've been the old, uh, you know, the new one, but not the old one. And so he tells me to get off on the Turon Road and come in. What was he doing? I mean, it's right downtown. I, so if you know Dean, when you see Max, would you tell him? He totally confused me. Uh, and so now I don't even know what I'm supposed to do this morning. Mark's telling me, just do what you always do. Um, we're here to talk about education. And, and I guess by way of introduction, we, there, there are three reasons why we have public schools. Uh, one reason is that we, we, want our, uh, we want our kids, when they graduate, to be able to participate in a democratic society. Uh, at midnight to, uh, last night, I guess we learned how important it is for us to stay abreast of those things. Uh, anybody noticed that there isn't a federal government so far today? I, <laughs> things seem to be working okay so far. Uh, but but we, you know, we want our kids to, be, uh, to understand government. We want them to understand what it means to be a participant in the democratic system. Uh, and then the second reason is that we want them to, to, to be able to live a fulfilled life, to understand culture and the arts, and uh, to, to, under, you know, to have a basic background of Western civilization. But the third reason, and uh, Mark makes fun of me because uh, his kids are all out and making a, uh, making a living, as it were, as it were. And, well, that's not, well, never mind. <laughs> uh, but my kids are in college right now, and I have one that's going to graduate this year and then one that's going to graduate in another year. So for me, right now, the most important thing is that we graduate kids that aren't going to come home and live in my basement. Um, and so that's really what we're going to talk about today. We want to talk about preparing kids for the world of work and whether that means uh, uh, an education beyond high school or just completing high school, uh, that's, that's what we want to talk about. Uh, we're not going to try to delve into the other two, although we certainly have opinions about those two, but uh, we, we want to talk about the, work, the world of work and what that means. And Mark's the guy that has all the, uh, the numbers, uh, a native son of Hayes America, uh, Mark Tall. Thank you, and uh, uh, great, great to be back, and it will always be my hometown, and thank you all for coming out this morning, and, and th thanks to our viewers. Uh, whenever, whenever you may be viewing this, uh, we do appreciate that. What, what we're going to talk about today? Wait we a have, second, I just talked bad about my dad, and this is going to be on TV. I didn't. Let me. And we. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's going to be a, be a scarce Christmas. This I haven't said anything bad about my dad yet. So <laughs> I have to try to try to stay on that. Uh, but the, the things we're talking about, we have we have handouts. I hope everyone picked them up on your way in. But uh, for for viewers at the KASB Kansas Association school board website which is kasb.org um, you can find all of these materials in various forms to use uh, this is part of the time of year where our association really does travel around the state uh, talking to educational leaders and others about issues that we expect to be dealing with in, in the upcoming year and important issues facing education uh, we're, we're doing regional meetings and so some of what we'll be talking about is kind of associated with this area but we're happy to be here to, to, to talk about what we've identified as the most important imperative that we face as educational leaders and that is raising the education levels of our population Population. We want to talk about some of the reasons we need to do that, and we want to talk about some of the things that Kansas is doing and we think Kansas needs to do to achieve that goal. Um, Dr. Hyde is here to make comments whenever he wants, and we'd welcome again. This isn't the most informal situation, but please, as we go forward, if you've got questions, feel free to ask them, bring up comments as we're, as we're going, that's okay. And then if we've got some time at the end, we'll be happy to come back to any of the questions or comments you might have as well. I'm kind of working from this one-page sheet, which just sort of summarizes the case we're making, but I'll refer to a couple of things. You know, as we have, as we have been looking at these issues and doing a little research, you know, there's something that maybe many of us know, but until you actually hear the numbers, um, it, it, it may not be quite as striking. In 1973, um, when, when I was just getting ready to start high school, basically three-fourths of the jobs in the United States required only a high school diploma or less. In other words, only one in four jobs in this country required any kind of post-secondary training. The latest research that we've seen, and a lot of this comes from the Center on Education and the Workforce at Georgetown University, uh, says that by 2020, 
two-thirds of the jobs uh, in this country will require um, uh, some type of post-secondary education. So we absolutely have to be continuing to change the, the preparation of our students if they're going to be able to effectively participate. And, and it's probably worth thinking a little bit about why that's happened. I mean, what's caused that? Well, I think the simplest thing is, is to say very low skill jobs that are easy to do, there are a lot of places in the world that will do them cheaper. And the second thing is lower skill, repetitive jobs. Well, it's been said that if something is just a repetitive task, you can invent a machine to do that. And so those, those types of jobs are simply not existing anymore in this country. We know that the Great Recession that we went through, for all its trauma, was most heavily felt in the parts of the economy where there are lower skill jobs, lower educational requirements. Many of those jobs have disappeared. Many of those jobs are simply not expected to come back. So we are facing a situation where the world that our students and children and grandchildren will go into simply looks different. And this is not a new phenomena because I remember when I went to work for KSB some years ago and sort of hadn't thought, we talk about, we're both involved in history, but something I never thought about was the fact that in the United States and Kansas, we didn't reach a point where half the population had a high school diploma until the 1960s. We sort of have this view that back in whatever the glorious good old days were, well, everyone was successful. Everyone went to high school. Everyone was apparently, you know, high skill preparation. That absolutely wasn't the case. In fact, our whole history of public education is continually increasing our standards and expectations to face a continually changing world. What we have found, and, and I guess the other thing to, to note about all of this is, not only do we know that the jobs are changing, but the way the economy rewards those jobs has changed. And very simply, the higher educational level you have, the higher income you're likely to have, and the, the less unemployment there is. That, so those are simple economic facts that we face that are affecting every state. Another thing that surprised us, and one thing I might note, uh, is that you have in this, or again, should be on our website, uh, uh, this is a little booklet, but it has PowerPoint slides that have some of the data I'm going to talk about, uh, and also a sheet that you got that has a bunch of little columns on it. The summary of this is simply to say that I said that, can, that nationally we know by 2020 we're expected that 65% of jobs will require some type of post-secondary education. What really surprised me is that in Kansas it's supposed to be 71%. In fact, in Kansas we are tied for fifth in the percentage of jobs that will require education beyond high school. Now, what this little complicated document is, if you go through it, this is a listing of all of the counties in the state of Kansas. And they're arranged in a way that probably won't make sense to you, but makes a great deal of sense of us because we've arranged it by KASB regions. And Ellis County, for example, is in region seven. So you have to turn um, to page, I guess it would be the bottom of page two, just and you can see like the, the second or third block of counties that are shaded. It says Cloud and then it says Ellis. And you might just want to go all the way over to the right hand side because we list for every county the statewide goal of 71%. You can see that Ellis County, the percentage of the current population that has some education beyond high school is 64.8%. Probably no surprise because of the presence of the university here that Ellis County is one of the uh, highest levels of education counties in the state. If you go all the way over to page three, you will note that as a state, we are at 60%. You could also look by using this kind of the, the your, your neighboring counties in this area and you will find that a number of counties are not close to that. The other columns simply for every county let you look at different levels. Who doesn't have any high school credential? Who is only high school? Who was a, a high school graduate? You know, uh, some uh, bachelor's degree, associate's degree. One thing, of course, that affects many counties in Kansas is the fact that we are an aging state with aging populations, and so to some extent there are parts of our state with a much older population that probably didn't maybe receive as, as, as high levels of education, and at this point won't, and frankly are out of the workforce. 
But the point is, what we have is a situation where across the state, we're going to have to improve our levels of achievement if we're going to meet those job needs. Now, one of the good things that we face is that Kansas already is one of the national leaders on educational attainment. Again, some of the information in our PowerPoint presentation will just note, for example, that of the states in what, what we kind of define as our region, which are our neighboring states, and we always throw in Iowa as a neighboring state, and then the plain states, which would include the Dakotas and Minnesota, and then we throw in Texas for good measure. If you take those 10 states, the only states that have a higher level of college completion for both a four-year degree and advanced degree are Colorado and Minnesota. By the way, no surprise, those two states are far and away the states with the highest per capita income, the least poverty. In other words, the states with the overall highest levels of education almost invariably are states with better economies and, and, and higher incomes for their, for their people because that's the way the economy is working. So the good news in Kansas is that we start at a, at a, at a good place compared to other states. The bad news is we obviously aren't there yet, and we're going to have to continue to try to work there. And the one other factor that we notice in, in Kansas is that even though we're, we're above the national average in where we need to get for educational attainment, we're above the national average for where we start, but we're also chasing the national average in a problem area, which is the percentage of our students that come from groups that tend not to do as well. Uh, as a matter of fact, Ten years ago, only about one in three Kansas students were on free reduced lunch, were relatively low income students. That has increased now to almost 50%. We are almost at the national average. We have fewer uh, minority students. Some minority groups also tend not to do as well, often because it's simply related to socioeconomic status. The percentage of, low in, of minority non-white students in Kansas has increased about 80% over the last decade. So even though we're still below the national average, we're rising rapidly. We're also different from many of our neighboring states. Those are kind of the challenges that we face. And what we want to spend next a few moments talking about are, are the things we think we need to do about. But I'd be happy to pause for a minute and see if either Dr. Heim has any comments or if there are any questions about any of these facts. OK, it's early, and I never allow enough time. Surprised by any of that data? Some of you were kind of shaking your heads, and I think what we often find talking to people is a sense, we generally know this is true, but maybe we haven't heard it quite that way, and so part of what we want to do is, is, is kind of give you the numbers to look at that. Well, let me talk a little bit then about, about our sort of vision for how we need to respond to this. Um, uh, for several years, uh, KASB has been trying to organize both what we advocate for politically uh, for education uh, and what is an association we try to help our members with around uh, this goal of improving student achievement and improving the readiness of our students for the rest of their lives. And we've sort of put together a plan that we call First in Education, the Kansas Way. And it's based on the goal of making Kansas the top achieving state in the country in terms of educational outcomes and doing it based on things that we think has and will continue to make Kansas successful. And there are three basic components of that plan that everything falls under. The first is raising educational standards. The second is providing suitable educational finance. And the third is strengthening local leaderships under our state, local leadership under our state constitution. Those are the three principles that we want to focus on. And, and probably the area that has been getting the most attention is the first one, and that's the area of raising educational standards. Um, so I want to talk about that first. One of the other handout stacks you have back there is a, a document that says uh, Common Core in Kansas. Uh, the the uh, cover document is something that our association produced. Within that, there are a number of other resource materials that are provided from the State Department of Education. But I think we want to start there. I think the idea is, is probably real simple. If we're going to get better performance from our students and from our school system, we have to continue to expect more. We have to keep rising the bar. And sometimes that can be a bit of a challenge because, again, we've had a lot of success. So the issue is, you know, how do you both 
be, be proud of what we've done and look at what works well while continuing to talk about getting better. That was a challenge that was faced by our State Board of Education several years ago. Uh, in fact, one of the things that our state legislature has required is that our state board every seven years, I think is what it is in the law, needs to review our academic standards. Now, academic standards in Kansas and most states are not requirements on what has to be taught. They are essentially a set of goals on what students should be expected to know and learn. And they're important mostly because then it helps our local boards and teachers, educators, even parents kind of have a sense of not what is going to be taught, but what we expect the learning to be at the end of that process. And when it was time to, to review and revise those standards in reading and math, Kansas participated with many other states in developing what are called now the Common Core State Initiative. Now, there's been a lot of controversy about this in the last few years, and one of the biggest misconceptions is this is a federal mandate or even a federal initiative. That is not the case. Common Core really was developed by an organization called the National Governors Association. You can probably tell from the title who's in that. Uh, they are state governors. Uh, and the other group was the uh, Council of Chief State School Officers, which is a fancy title for people like Kansas's Commissioner of Education. They are the people in every state who are responsible for running their departments of education for the K-12 school system. And the people in those organizations basically said, you know, we all set standards and we all test our students and we all have to figure out what we want. Wouldn't it make sense if we kind of work together to come up with a shared vision of what states expect? Now, why would you do that? Well, one is simply the understanding that in this country people move around a lot. And so if you move for work or job or military service and you have some sense uh, that uh, I'm, I'm moving from Kansas to Mississippi or California to Kansas or whatever it might be, that you kind of roughly know what the same expectations are. The second thing is we know our economy is, is in many ways both national and international. So the fact of the matter is our colleges, our employers, have basically identified the kind of skills they want. In fact, in a real sense, we've, we've kind of already done this in this country because we have things like the ACT test and the SAT test that all of our colleges use. And state students in states all over the country participate in those. But there are no standards for those tests. And so the idea behind the Common Core was to have states work together to come up with a set of expectations that, that kids would be expected to know all over the country and then allow every state to decide whether or not they wanted to voluntarily participate in doing that. That's what was developed. Kansas is now one of about 44, 45 other states that has chosen to be either part of the reading or math. Now, has there been a federal involvement in this? Well, there has to a point because the uh, Obama administration uh, decided under some of their authority to encourage states to develop new standards. And one of the standards that could be approved is the Common Core. It's not the only one. As a matter of fact, I just saw the news today that says Texas has been approved for a federal waiver without adopting the Common Core standards because they chose to develop a different set of standards. Kansas Board of Education basically looked at those standards and said, we believe these are as good as we could come up with on our own, so let's participate. By the way, on the back page of this, you can see a very small example of the kinds of things that are in those standards. And what, what we've really suggested to everyone is, if you have concerns about what's in the standards, just do an internet search of Common Core standards and read them because they basically say things like, in second grade, you should be able to measure objects using tools like a ruler or a tape measure. Doesn't seem very subversive. The idea is to simply say, what do we expect students to know as they move through the process? And that's what they've done. So the other thing I think that is important to understand about the goal of the standards was to try to develop a set of standards that were really designed not on the kind of expectations we've had in the past, which I've kind of characterized as sort of <laughs> basic proficiency. Maybe the best thing to say is, what do you need to graduate from high school? I mean, because in a sense, that's what our, our standard has been. You know, it's worth thinking that in Kansas, it's really only been about a decade that we've even had a differentiation between admission to universities based on just a diploma and qualified admissions. 
so 10, 15 years ago, Kansas decided we're going to have a, a sort of a higher set of expectations to do that. Not every student does that. Not every student will continue to do that. But the common core standards are based on the idea that all students are going to need perhaps not a four-year degree, but some type of post-secondary training or at least a higher level of skills than we expected in the past. And so the common core standards were designed around those goals. So the State Board of Education in Kansas, now several years ago, 2011, was when they were first adopted and districts have been in the process of implementing them. The second thing, so that, so first part of change, new standards. Okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe we ought to stop and ask for questions. That'd be fine. Because there have, there's been a lot of media attention to the Common Core standards recently, and so maybe we could help answer any questions you all have. Next generation science standards, any comments about that? And funding from the legislature, it's, we've heard rumor that over the last several months that they may not be interested in funding anything to do with the Common Core. Uh, the very, very good questions. First of all, on the next generation science standards, they're not part of the Common Core initiative, but they were developed by a coalition of, of states that got together in kind of a similar process. And again, I think the State Board of Education basically decided that rather than developing uh, a set of standards on our own, if we worked with other states and then reviewed them, go through a process of having Kansas educators and leaders look at them and, and decide if they were felt they were high quality, they did. So they're, they're part of state standards, but they're not part of the Common Core. Uh, they will be part of what students are tested on, but not part of the tests that are used for federal accountability. Now in terms of funding, uh, there was uh, uh, several attempts last session uh, to prohibit funding from implementing the, the standards. Uh, we, fi we fully expect that to happen again, and that's part of the reason that we're engaged in this process, is to try to help communities understand and work with their legislators on exactly what they do and why they're being done. Frankly, we're a little unsure exactly how you prohibit funding of a standard. Because again, if you, if you take my example, I mean, it's a little hard to say that you, you can't spend money to, to teach measurement. Um, so it, it's unclear as to what that would be. What is a more realistic, I think, issue is the fact that in order to actually uh, give, give uh, measurement to our academic standards, we do assessments. And the next piece of this that the State Board of Education has has not decided what they're going to do, but is in the process, will be selecting a new testing system to replace the one we've used for over a decade that will basically, you know, in a real simple sense, it will ask questions that are related to the new standards. So that, again, teachers, students, families, you know, it's kind of like, you tend to do better on a test if you sort of know what's expected of you, so that's the idea to bring those together. Right now, the tests that we're currently using do not measure the new standards. However, it is expected that the new tests will be more expensive, which would mean the legislature would probably have to come up with additional money. And the reason that they're expected to be more expensive, whatever test we use, is they will be more complex tests because we're trying to measure more complex things. Goes back to that thing I said at the very beginning. We've had an education system which is largely based on an economic system that kind of rewarded, well, rote memory, basic skills, you know, it, well, kind of what can you memorize. The new system is designed to be more based on having students demonstrate what they're able not just to do, but learn. And that is something that is harder to measure on just a little bubble test. And so the goal of the new testing system, whatever it is, is designed to be something which we're already computer-based, but something that provides more quicker response to teachers and, and, and everyone to know how students are doing, and also will measure skills at a higher level. But for that to happen, in other words, if the state board decides whatever group, whatever test they want to use this fall in order to fully implement them, it's likely to require some additional dollars from the legislature. I think our belief is that, and, I, and I, I guess I didn't mention this, or it wasn't mentioned in my introduction that I am a lobbyist, 
Um, so we'll get we that out on the table. Yeah, it's not something you you, 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 you always want to yeah, champion, but no, I'm proud of what I do because I'm, I'm, an, I'm an advocate for education. And what I feel last year in the legislature is much of what the legislature was concerned about was simply not knowing. They didn't know what the Common Core was. They didn't know where it came from. They didn't know what would happen. So, and it's legitimate. When, you, when you're looking at big changes and you're not aware of the reason, it's legitimate to ask questions. And, and a lot of what we tried to do, and what we're trying to do this year, is answer those questions and, 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 and hope that that will result in a legislature that will, that will, quite frankly, not make us start over. Because I think, in a sense, that's I think as we talk to school leaders around the state, one of the biggest worries is to say, you know, we've gone a long way on a direction to keep to keep pace with the rest of the country. And if at this point we simply say, no, you got to start over, and maybe go through a process that would get us in exactly the same point if in fact we go through a process which says, you know, on our own we're going to look at what students need to do. But if in Kansas we're going to look at what we want our kids to know, isn't it probably going to know? We're going to want our students to know what they know in other states and other countries. So probably the first thing we do would be look at the Common Core standards. So in that sense, I think our biggest concern is that blocking implementation of the Common Core will simply set us back. The other thing that I think we, we, we want to go back and continue to stress is much of what you hear in the news and fear around the country is not so much based on what's wrong with the standards, but what's based on concern about curriculum. You know, I've heard that we're going to have to use this book. We're going to have to buy this computer program. You're not going to be able to teach this. Nothing in the Common Core directs what textbooks you have to use, what materials you have to use, how teachers teach. Now, again, let's be perfectly honest, if you decide you don't want to teach anything in these standards, your students may not do very well on the tests that measure these things, but how you teach measurement or how you uh, approach uh, helping kids have an understanding of 18th, 19th, 19th and early 20th century foundational works of American literature is entirely up to the local district to figure that out. And that is a key thing that I think has to be stressed. The final thing that we often hear concerns about is the issue of cost. And I have acknowledged that the testing portion of implementing this new system is expected uh, to cost somewhat more. And now, again, it's interesting to note that I've always heard, and I think this is true, that Kansas' current system is just about the lowest cost system in the entire country. Most states spend more than Kansas. Um, uh, we've, we've had a very good deal, quite frankly, from the testing center at the University of Kansas. And quite frankly, one option for the state board is to continue to use KU's system. But I think even KU has communicated that if you want kids tested with the, the, the level of depth and uh, of knowledge that we've talked about, they're going to have a higher bid as well because, again, we're asking more to be done. But the fact of the matter is, most of the other costs of implementing the Com Common Core in Kansas really already are already in because there are things like teacher training, which we've been in the part of, selecting new instructional materials, which we would have done anyway if a new, when a new set of standards was adopted. And I mean, I guess in a certain sense, we might have to go through the same thing. Uh, again, let's be honest, there will be a higher cost to the Common Core, but that cost is associated with getting more kids to higher standards. So if that's your goal, I mean, if you're basically saying we have to have more kids graduating, more kids prepared for uh, technical colleges, more kids prepared for, for four-year colleges and beyond, whatever set of standards you're using, it's going to cost more because all the data tells us the, the states that have higher percentages of kids that are college ready are states that tend to spend more in education um, because, it, it, because we're, we're asking for a, 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 a more expensive and a more extensive outcome. Any other questions or comments on kind of the common core and the testing issue. Yes? When you say that they have to spend more to get more, are they spending more on the test, or are they spending more on resources? Other states? Mm -hmm. The total resources. Well, all, all, all the research that we've looked at is that if you examine states by how well their students do on a variety of measures, graduation rates, uh, national assessment of education progress, 
uh, ACT scores, all of those measures. The highest performing states in the country tend to spend more. The lowest spending states tend to have less. Well, there are exceptions. Uh, uh, you know, it's not a perfect one-on-one -on -one match. When you pull those averages together, it's very clear. And quite frankly, something to be proud of in Kansas there are we spend below the national average and dropping. And yet we tend to rank on every measure in the top 10 or 15 states on almost every measure you want to look at. Most of the other states at, at those levels spend considerably more than Kansas. And you might ask, well, what would that be for? Well, a lot of it is you may have smaller pupil-teacher ratios. You may pay teachers more. You may have a more of an investment in technology and professional develop and those, development and those kinds of issues. Um, so uh, again, most things in an economic world, <laughs> you, you usually get what you pay for. And one of the concerns we have uh, is that if Kansas doesn't continue to, to fund education at a level that will let, let us keep up with, with our peer states and the rest of the world, we're going to fall behind, ultimately, to the detriment of our students and our economy. We certainly are concerned about some of the trends that, that we're in right now. Um, one of the things that has had a major impact in Kansas is that as we uh, have moved out of the recession, um, along with many other states, as our economy has started to rebound, uh, the governor and legislature in Kansas decided the best way to accelerate that process is with significant tax cuts. Um, we hope they're right. Uh, because uh, as, it, as it stands now, I think our projections for the next few years is that it will be very difficult to do any more than keep education funding flat. And when costs rise, when inflation goes up, and those sorts of things that just tends to happen all the time, in a way we're really concerned that's going backwards. Now, uh, if the economy starts growing at a much more rapid rate, then the, 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 the tax base will, will rise and revenues from uh, uh, all across the system can go up. We certainly hope that's the case. The assumptions that the legislature, legislative staff has made uh, do not take into account this sort of additional burst of growth. So I think we're, we're waiting eagerly to see what happens. In fact, at an important date in early November that a small number of us worry about every year <laughs> is what we call the consensus revenue estimates in Kansas, and that's when we'll get an official prediction of how the economy is expected to grow in the next year. Um, and, and we're certainly going to have to hope that that, that that is up and that it's up into the next few years. Without that, it is going to be very, very difficult um, because, again, the, the current expectations of state revenue are very limited and the only choices outside of that quite frankly are to allow or require local districts to raise their own revenue and there's a lot of issues involved with that right now that's almost off the table because a number of districts in the state I, I think Hayes and many others are capped at how much you can even raise locally if you wanted to raise more did you have a comment Dr. Well, was, that's a very political answer you gave Mark. Uh, and I guess since the cameras are rolling, you were trying to be political. But if you if you look at the information that we handed out, if you look under uh, on the right column there under suitable finance, um, yeah, we we have some data. And there, there uh, obviously there's way, more than one way to look at any kind of financial situation, and it's there's more than one way to look at the state's budget. Um, some would argue that our our school funding has been level over the years and, and it, it, even in an economic recession like we had we were able to maintain level funding and uh, that's something that uh, some of the folks in Topeka uh, brag about and that's true uh, if you look at it strictly from uh, the amount of dollars that are going into the system uh, but there, there are other ways of looking at that and if you look at that Mark's done some research on adjusting for inflation so um, I'm getting I'm getting out on a limb here, Mark. I don't know what your data says, but I think it was over 10 years. Did you look at the 10-year period? So over a 10-year period, when you adjust school funding for inflation, uh, we've actually gone down. Well, we're about we're about where we were 10 years ago. We increased after the previous school finance decision to about 2000 through 2009, and we have now fallen back to 
in all dollars about where we were 10 years ago in operating dollars even below where we were 10 years ago adjusted for inflation. And then the, the other information here, we're, we're underfunding local option budgets by $100 million, which, which means that local, local school boards are faced with the decision then of whether they want to increase local property taxes or decrease budgets. Um, and that uh, depends on the wealth of the school district. Hayes is a fairly wealthy school district, and so it doesn't affect you as much as it might some of your neighbors who, who don't have as much uh, uh, money as y'all do. But I think the most telling statistic that, that we've looked at is uh, the percentage of personal income that goes to education. And uh, Mark likes to say that he started high school in 19... 73, 73, something like that. Um, and his, uh, we won't ask when you started high school. <laughs> it was just a couple of years before that. But, but tell, tell the story about, the, uh, well, what percentage of income did your parents contribute compared to what we're comparing, what, what we're uh, uh, presenting now? The, 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 the number that we can go that far, I want to be very clear because people look very closely at my answer say he's such a politician, but it's true. If you look at what we consider operating budgets, which is basically not things like bond issues and retirement programs, but what you bring to bear, the percentage of uh, income that my parents and grandparents were paying when I was in school in the 60s and 70s um, was about three and a half percent, between three and a half and four percent. It's been at that level for decades. It has now fallen below that level for the first time, and we project it to go lower. In fact, we expect we are at or will soon be below three percent of personal income going to operate our budgets. So again, the simple fact of the matter is at a time when we know we have to bring students to higher levels of achievement, we are actually spending less of our total income as Kansans to operate our schools. Now, again, the, the, the and I think that's especially telling when you think about all the things that schools have been required to take on since the time that Mark and I were in school. Exactly. Uh, you know, we're, we're doing so much more with students with special needs. Uh, we're doing so many more kind of social programs than I've ever done before, and yet we're spending a lower percentage of our of our personal income to do that. Uh, and I think, just think that's a testament to uh, uh, both to the fact that we have a very prosperous society and that we've done a, a, an efficient job in schools. It, it, it is, and that, you know, kind of using the 70s as kind of a benchmark, as I started about saying. We never thought the 70s I, the was the seven, benchmark the, the, the 70s show. Kind of low, low yeah. point for culture, we know that. <laughs> The, uh, uh, we talked about job data, but again, when you talk about those, those numbers, it's, it's worth noting that pre-1970, we had no legal special education requirements. We had no Title IX requirements. We had no constitutional requirements for equity in school finance. You know, the, you could pretty much spend whatever you wanted at that point. Um, we certainly paid, we, we were a decade or two in many places removed from legal segregation and desegregation uh, uh, in this country. And again, we were preparing students for a workforce that where only basically one in four kids uh, was probably expecting or needed to go to college. That has changed in every way. And the other thing that's worth noting is despite what you might hear, by every measure, educational attainment is higher than it was at that time for every uh, uh, every every group of overall students for every group of students minority students um, the outcomes are all much higher we often don't hear that and so in effect we are getting much better educational outcomes and have a much more educated and prosperous society while actually spending at or less as a share of our income as an investment of our income uh, than we did essentially a generation ago. Um, the, the, the question is really how we move forward with that to meet these new challenges. And I think our point is if we've started by saying one answer is to expect more and have higher standards, we have to accept the fact that, that that's going to cost more. Uh, I would argue it may well not cost any more, again, as a share of our income but it's certainly going to cost more than the same thing with no with no adjustment for for dollars. Last, have we scared yeah. anybody else away from asking asking <laughs> questions. <laughs> Mark, 
Thank God I'm going to be here forever. <laughs> no, no. We're, we're going to honor your time. And, and honestly, one more quick point I want to make, and then we'll, we'll throw up with whatever discussion you have, and that's kind of the last sort of pillar of our program, and that's what we call local leadership under the Constitution. We've talked about some of the things we're very proud of, and we've asked ourselves, well, how do we get this? And frankly, how does Kansas do better than other states for the dollars we're spending, for the, for the kids we have to educate? And we believe part of it is because Kansas has always not only valued, but constitutionally enshrined the importance of local control and local governance. We are a state that says in our constitution that public schools are to be maintained, developed, and operated by locally elected boards. What that means is we recognize that one-size-fits-all solutions don't work in every community. And so the model that we've always had in Kansas is to set state goals and then let local communities figure out how to get there. And, and of course, representing local school boards, that may not be a shock for you, but I hope we've demonstrated, we think there's evidence to say that that's successful. And our concern is that, that part of the agenda uh, around the country, and by some in Kansas, we really think runs the risk of weakening that tradition. Uh, and this happens in a lot of ways, by new mandates that, that says how you have to spend your money, how you have to, how you have to do things. Um, uh, you know, or, or frankly, going around local school boards by, by talking about setting up schools that don't have that local accountability. Um, uh, steps like that, and, and of course in some states there, there's movements to even get rid of local school boards. Um, it's not really clear what they'd be replaced by, and what some might argue is simply a system of, you know, perhaps privatization for schools. And our belief is we have succeeded in Kansas because we allow people in every community who know its needs best, who know the needs of their students best, to make the decisions of how to, how to achieve those goals. We think that's very important uh, to sustain as we move forward. So that's, that's kind of our plan. I, I think it is a recognition that we have to continue to improve. We think that the direction our state has set, set out in doing makes a lot of sense. Uh, we think to be successful, it's going to take resources that the state really has the obligation to provide, and we think the best way to decide how those resources are used to meet those goals is by letting local communities make those decisions through their own locally elected officials. So that's our pitch, and again, we'll, we'll wrap up by seeing whatever, whatever final questions that you might have, and I will try not to talk until the tape runs out. for school consolidation in the state of Kansas? Well, I, I was, it, it, we've done quite a bit of research to uh, put this program together. I, I've been interested to see that uh, in the last 10, I, I get the time periods mixed up, but we've gone from 304 school districts to 285 school districts in the last oh, 10 so years or so. Since 2001. So we've eliminated, uh, do that math in my head, carry the one. Uh, we've eliminated 20 school districts just in the last 10 years. So, so uh, and I don't think most, I didn't realize it was that high of a number. Uh, we have more districts that are in cooperative agreements uh, than before, that there's some financial advantages to them doing that. And, and we've helped a lot of districts as a school boards association do those kinds of things. I think that we'll constantly be looking at efficiencies um, but I, I don't think that the, the legislature is going to mandate, they won't even say the word, you know, they call it the C word, uh, consolidation. So uh, I don't think we'll see a mandate, but I think if, if the funding crunch continues, you'll have people that are doing it just because they have to. And, and then there's the, there's the whole curriculum piece, you know, when you get so small, you can't really offer what your students need and you have to make decisions based on that. But, I think we'll see more of it, uh, but I don't think it'll be forced. And, and actually, the, the position that our members have, have given us is that we support the idea of incentives. Um, we know in some cases it may make sense and yet be a tough local decision. And so while we don't think it is something, again, where the state ought to say, well, we, we know when and where it happens, we do think that wherever the state can come in and say, you know, if this, if this may make sense for you, we want to give you some incentives or do things that, to make it easier to happen. Again, I think Dr. Hahn's right. The worst thing is that it, if we continue to go forward with um, a, 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 a extremely limited funding 
then districts will have to look for ways uh, to cut costs and and about the only practical way to do that at some points becomes changing how you operate and and as we've always said consolidating districts saves you almost nothing you save money if you close buildings yeah. and consolidating districts is usually simply a way of closing a high school is really what it comes down to and that's very painful and there's often this idea that well we don't want to close but many political leaders know say well we don't want to close schools you know we know people like their schools we just want to get rid of all that administrative overhead the fact of the matter is most of the administrative overhead if you want to look at it that way is associated really with operating buildings most small districts in Kansas the, the superintendent for example is also a building principal and wears a number of other hats so again you don't you don't save money unless you close buildings. And closing buildings has a direct impact on towns, communities, or neighborhoods. I mean, because what, what we know around the state, the, the issue of closing a school in a large community like Topeka, which is right now in the middle of a very controversial effort to be more efficient, to deal with funding cuts, closing buildings. And you know, all over the city of Topeka, there are people very concerned they're going to lose their neighborhood school. What will that mean for their students? Etc. So um, it, that's just, I think, a consequence, and it's a choice that really Kansans have to have. If you want to spend less on education, it, it's it's going to have a meaning, and the most obvious meaning you're going to close schools and you're going to have fewer people because that's what school money is spent on: <laughs> people and operating buildings. Less of that, you know, less money, you have less of those two things. Nobody wants to be that one kid in class who were asked that last question, you know. Well, thank you guys for coming. Very informative. Thank you very Thanks much for that. Thank, thank all of you. And again, I hope you can find, find these resources, use them, share them. And if there are any of those last minute questions you didn't want to ask, I'm sure I'm sure you can find our email addresses or something in all this material or somewhere else. We'll be happy to respond. Hayes, thank you so much for hosting. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.